If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to 1 Samuel 28. First Samuel 28. First Samuel 28, and let's begin at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare, to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Achish was the king of the Philistines, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. Now most of you realize that at this point in David's history, he has been running from Saul for years now. And um, finally, just in, in desperation to get away from Saul, he, he decides to flee into the land of the Philistines and Achish was the king of Gath. Man, I got thinking about this. What a what an amazing thing that is because David slew Goliath and Goliath was from Gath. And we know from the scriptures that some of Goliath's uh, uh, children were still living and they get taken out in battle later. Um, Goliath had some brothers. So, you know, there was, it was, it's really significant that he winds up in the land of Achish, in the land of the Philistines, king of Gath, and he winds up there for a year and four months. And uh, so finally he, he, he flees here just for safety. Um, and it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with David. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. So the, the Philistines... Are just, they've made this decision to attack Israel. And Achish knows that David is a mighty man. And um, David has his 600 men with him. So Achish is thinking, man, this is a good thing. I've got some valiant fighting men that can help me. And so he's, he's going to take David into battle with him against Israel. And David gives sort of a, a, a vague answer in verse 2. And David said to Achish, surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And David, David says, you know what? You're, you're going to see what we can do. And Achish said to David, therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done. Now, of course, Saul is disguised. She doesn't realize she's talking to Saul. Thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swear to her by the Lord. Now think about that statement. He's dealing with a witch here. And so he says, I promise you in the name of God Almighty. It's pretty crazy. And Saul swore to her by the Lord saying, as the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, 
bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. Why did she do that? A familiar spirit. The, the familiar spirit was the way that they would talk to the dead and they would, they would go to someone that had a familiar spirit. And, and this woman um, had the ability to bring up an evil spirit that was so familiar with a certain personality. You know, normally they would say, you know, I, I want to talk to my Aunt Martha or I want to talk to my, my grandfather or whatever. And so this, this spirit would come up and um, uh, perhaps there was an apparition, you know, a, a visible shape, perhaps not. But there would be a voice. And that voice would be, I mean, it sounded exactly like the voice of grandma or the voice of Aunt Martha. And so much so that that person would feel as though that I am talking to that person. That, that spirit, you know, that spirit was familiar with them while they lived. That familiar spirit knew everything about them, knew their likes, their dislikes, where they had went. Their, the phrases that they used, their accent, and that spirit was a counterfeit of that person. So she looks at the person in front of her, not knowing it's King Saul, and she says, uh, okay, who do you want me to bring up? No, no doubt, no doubt they paid some good money here because they didn't do this for free. And, um, and Saul says, I want you to bring up Samuel. Now, she's used to a familiar spirit coming up, and perhaps that spirit would even possess her body, but she's used to that. But what she wasn't used to was what happened. And what happened was Saul literally comes up from the underworld. You got to remember in the Old Testament, you know, there were two parts to the underworld. There was, there was the hell side, and there was Abraham's bosom. That's why in Luke 16, the, the rich man dies and goes to hell, and he looks across the chasm and he says, there is a great gulf betwixt me and thee. And I cannot cross to thee. The rich man is in hell, but, but the beggar is in Abraham's bosom. And so they're both in the heart of the earth. It was not until Christ died and spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth that he led captivity captive. And he took the dead out of the earth. They couldn't go to heaven until the price was paid. And by one sacrifice, Christ entered into the holy place with his own blood and made redemption for us. He, one day, in that three-day period, he walked into heaven with his own blood. And the great sacrifice, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, the sin of the world of all time. Now, the Old Testament saints could go up and Jesus took them into heaven. But at this point in time, they're in the heart of the earth in, in that separate place called Abraham's bosom. And the woman says, uh, she, she, she literally cries out. She, she screams. You know why she screams? Because she was not expecting what happened here. Because this wasn't the spirit she was used to dealing with. This was... The real deal. One of those things God only allows. You know, there's a few things like this in the Bible that happened once and they never seem to ever happen again. And Samuel comes up out of the heart of the earth. Verse 12. And the woman saw Samuel and she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul in that moment. In that moment, she knew what was going on. Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid. For what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. She, she saw the spirit world. That was She was a witch. She was used to dealing with that dark world. It wasn't the first time she'd seen spirits. Saul said, What did you see? She said, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle. Boy, that mantle was the, the mark of the prophets. Elijah goes up to heaven in a fiery chariot. And Elisha says, Lord, I want a double portion. And, and 
And Elisha says, how will I know? And, and Elijah said, if you see me go up. And Elisha sees that fiery chariot and the mantle falls from Elijah. And it goes to Elisha. It was the mark of a prophet. Verse 14. And he, Saul, said unto the witch, her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? You know, this was odd even to Samuel. Can you imagine how, how long Samuel's been dead? He hasn't been, he hasn't been dead very long. You know, uh, nobody lands on the other side and expects to come back to this earth. And I, you know, you don't know how it happened. I don't know if it, God sent an angel. And the angel goes down and says, uh, Samuel, I know that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're down here and, and you're resting, but uh, we need you back up on earth for a few minutes. And Samuel's like, wow. And you know what? The, 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 in, in those few moments there, the angel fills him in on what's going on because because he knows the answer to Saul's question. Verse 15, and Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed. For the Philistines make war against me. And God is departed from me and answereth no more. Answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called thee, that thou mayest may that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me? Samuel realized this whole thing is ridiculous. He said, you, You're you're asking me. He says, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee? And has become thine enemy. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand. And given it to thy neighbor even to David. Because thou obeyedst not the voice of the Lord. Nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover. The Lord will deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. He says you're going to lose this battle. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage of scripture and lord um we marvel at it we pray lord that you'd help us that we might receive or the lesson that you have for us here tonight in jesus name amen you know uh in verse one and and you you see it um uh, in verse four the philistines have gathered the philistines and they are determined to attack israel you know if if the israelites had fully obeyed God way back when in the book of Joshua. If they had fully obeyed the Lord, there would be no, there would be no Philistines. This event would not be occurring. Would you look at a few verses with me? Look at Numbers 33. Numbers 33. Verse 50. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Numbers 33, verse 50. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out ALL, all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, 
and quite plucked down all their high places. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein. For I have given you the land to possess it. And I'm just going to say this in passing. That land, that land, man, oh man, the battle is over that piece of land. That land belongs to Israel. Boy, they're always trying to get a two-state solution. And all this nonsense is just goes on and on and on. And, on. And, and boy, that land is the issue. But way back, way back, God says, I drove out those people. I expect you to drive them out because this land is yours. Verse 54, and ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more ye shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer ye shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass. Then those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. He said, if you let any of them stay, he said, they are going to bother you from now on. You're going to wish you had driven them out. Look at Deuteronomy 7. We're going to bounce around just for a minute or two. Deuteronomy 7. But follow along. Follow along. Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them. And utterly, that means absolutely, completely, utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Verse 3, you won't make marriage with them. Verse 4, for they will turn away thy sons from following me. And then verse 5, he says, again, you'll destroy their altars, their images, all that remains of their idolatry. Go to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31. He says, you shall utterly destroy them, nor show mercy unto them. Now, you know, this is one of those things that the enemies of Christianity, and especially the enemies of the Bible, um, they just have a heyday with this. And they say, well, how can you follow a God that would do this, this? And, of course, the famous beloved word of this age is the word genocide. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's like for Christians, just like the word heresy. You know, anytime, anytime they... They, they don't like you and you disagree with them, well, they slap the heresy word on you. You're a heretic! And that, that word gets thrown around a lot. And the word genocide gets thrown around a lot. Um, but whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. And of course, all these countries that make noise about genocide recently, you got Russia, that was operating concentration camps. You know, uh, you know the, the big stink about World War II and the Nazis and the concentration camps, which was valid, which was very valid. And there were many more than just the few you hear about, many more. Uh, but, you know, that was the whole thing and, and the Nazis and their crimes. And, and you know what? The world made a big deal about that. But what the world never made a big deal about it was up until, you know, even very recent history, you know, I, even into the early 90s. There were over a hundred labor camps still in operation in Russia. There are many, many concentration camps still in operation in North Korea. Some of those camps, Camp number 17 in North Korea has 250,000 prisoners and less than 50 have ever escaped and lived to tell it. Let's talk, they, you know, what hypocrisy. Russia goes before the United Nations. We need to stop this genocide. China, we need to stop this genocide. <laughs> the bloodiest butchers on earth. They're making noise about genocide. Oh, we don't like your Bible. And they'll, they'll point to things like this. Let's read. Where are we at? Deuteronomy 31, verse 1. 
And when boy, people get upset about, you know what their problem is? They, they watch way too much media and they, they're suckers. They just let the media just play on their bleeding heart while, while all the butchering around the world just gets ignored. Deuteronomy 31 verse one. And Moses went and spake these words into all Israel. And he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also, the Lord hath said unto me, thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee. And he will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. Now watch. And the Lord shall do unto them. Who? Who would do it? Say it out loud. The Lord. The Lord. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon and Og, king of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face. So what happened with Sihon and Og? Uh, go back to Numbers 21 for a moment. Lord said, when you go in, he says, I want you to do what Moses, what really what you guys did in, in, in Numbers 21. Um, you you got to remember Numbers 21, the children of Israel did get to conquer a couple kings just before they went in. Numbers 21, verse 21. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, <clears throat> Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well, but we will go along by the king's highway until we be past thy borders. And Sihon would not suffer Israel to pass through his border. But Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon unto Jabbok, even unto the children of Ammon. For the border of the children of Ammon was strong. And Israel took all these cities and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites. Go to verse 33. And they turned and went up by the way of Beth Bashan. And all the king of Bashan went out against them, he and all his people, to the battle at Edrai. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand and all his people in his land. And Now watch. And thou shalt do to him as thou didst unto Sihal, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him and his sons, and all his people until there was none left him alive. They're getting ready to go in the land of Canaan in Deuteronomy. And, and Moses reminds them of what they did with Sihon and Og. And he says, the Lord's going to, the Lord's going to do this, but the Lord's going to use you to do it. And he said, what you're going to do in Canaan is the same thing we did with Sihon and Og. He said, I don't want any of them left alive. Look at Deuteronomy 20, Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 20, verse 16. Deuteronomy 20, verse 16. But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord hath God hath commanded thee. So go to Joshua 13, Joshua 13. So now, um, you know, you're, you're, um, they've come to this place where they have, they went into the, the Canaan land and for five years they've waged war and they have for the most part conquered the land. They have, they have, they have accomplished enough that they can take over the land and they can claim the land. But there's still pockets of the enemy throughout the land. They have just squelched the majority to the point where they are divided and separated. And from now, from this point on, it shouldn't be too hard of a conquest. Okay? Shouldn't be too hard. Look what Joshua says. Joshua 13, verse 1. 
Now Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth. Okay, here you go. Ready? Where did the Philistines come in? They were part of one of those seven nations. Here we go. This is the land that yet remaineth, all the borders of the Philistines. And all Geshurai from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even into the borders of Ekron. Ekron was a Philistine city, which is counted to the Canaanite. Five lords of the Philistines. And every time the Philistines show up, you see these five lords. The Gazathites, the Astathites, the Eskalonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, also the Avites. So there's the Philistines. I got a I got an article somebody somebody um, uh, posted recently, and uh, and it was just very interesting, um, and it's in light of the recent events overseas, and you guys are all well aware of what I'm talking about. So um, listen to this for just a moment, all right? The guy says, you see here in the civilized wor world, we have some core beliefs. We believe that if you treat someone with respect and dignity, they will reciprocate. But the thing is, the radical world over there does not share that value. You treat that radical world over there with all the dignity in the world, but you're still an infidel and they still want you dead, no matter how you treat them. The West needs to understand that. The radicals' war over there is not about land. It's not about human rights or anything else. It is a religious war, and it's a war against everything we believe in. We like to give them fancy names like Hamas and Hezbollah and Houthis and ISIS, etc. You can call them, and I quote, you can call them whatever you want, but it's all the same garbage. You can march for them day and night, but don't kid yourself that if they have a chance to bring October 7th to a theater near you, they wouldn't hesitate for a second. And if they don't get defeated over there, we're next. The, ra the thing is, it's politically not correct to say it, but the radicals over there are a global plague. This is not about Israel, and it isn't about land. It isn't about a state. It's about dead Jews and the defeat of the West. Over here in the West, we have red lines that we would never cross. And there are things that we consider never okay. But that's not the case for them. It's time we understand this. For them, rape is okay. For them, pedophilia is okay. For them, mutilating bodies is okay. For them, burning families is okay. For them, decapitating, ba cutting babies' heads off is okay. They have no red lines. And the most tragic part of all is, why did God say, go in there and annihilate them? Why? Here it is. The most tragic part of it all is the indoctrination of children who are taught to murder the infidels. I saw a picture of a woman with her new baby. And, and the man is there with all his garb on. And they have, they have a picture of Jews being killed beside them. They have a machine gun beside them. They have like, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong, but you'll get, they have an RPG beside them. And they're saying, I hope they die in the battle against the Jews. When does that start? You ought, you ought to see the pictures. They're taught that in school. They're taught that in their cartoons. In their cartoons. You can't make peace with the people who believe you have no right to exist. And the guy said this. There is no fixing them. It's ingrained in them before they can talk. It's time we stopped speaking our language and started speaking theirs. God said, you know what? Go in and annihilate. Now you got to remember a couple things. Ready? God announced 400 years beforehand that this was going to happen. God said in Genesis, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. 
God waited for 400 years is a long time. What if I said 400 years from now, I'm going to give you a piece of land. None of you in here would be thrilled about it. You know why? It's so, but God waited 400 years. It says the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. God waited 120 years while he had somebody preaching from an ark under construction for 120 years. What about God's law and suffering at Nineveh? Jonah goes in, they're marked for destruction, and God was going to wipe them off the map. But Nineveh, wonder of wonders, they repent. And God says, you know what? I'm going to wait another 150 years. God is long-suffering. And here they are. And now they are suffering. Israel's suffering. Because in here in this story that we're reading. Because they never fully did what God said. And so God said, this is what would occur. And so the Philistines, all through the history of Israel, these nations are a thorn in their side. And it just goes on and on and on. Look at verse 5 of uh, our text. 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. Boy, Saul is in trouble. Saul is in trouble. The dark clouds are rolling in and he can see the lightning and the thunder coming. And he has no connection with God. And where is Saul at? It's like in Hebrews 27. It says, there remain nothing but a fearful looking for of judgment. And, and, and Saul is there. One guy said long ago that troubles and terrors are to the children of disobedience. But in this nightmare, Saul inquires of the Lord. Verse 6, he, he inquired of the Lord. You know, need drives people to God. And need drives people to God who in the day of their prosperity, you know, when everything was going good, they ignored the Lord. And that was Saul. Isaiah 26 says, they poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. In Psalm 78, it says, when they slew him, when the Lord slew them, then they sought him. In Isaiah 36, it says, Lord, in trouble have we visited thee. Saul sought the Lord. Saul inquired of the Lord, but the Lord answered him not. Wonder why? You know, there's a couple reasons. He inquired, and here it says he inquired, and yet in another place it says he didn't. Look at 1 Chronicles 10. 1 Chronicles 10. 1 Chronicles 10. This is the same context. It's the same, it's the same time frame. Uh, what you have here is, um, is actually a few days after the event that occurred. And uh, Saul has died in battle, just like, just like uh, Samuel said he would. And the Holy Ghost makes a couple comments here in 1 Kings 10, verse 13. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Now watch. And inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him. What a strange statement. In 1 Samuel 28, it says he did inquire of the Lord. But did he really? You know what he did? He inquired of the Lord in such a way it was really as if he didn't inquire at all. Inquire means to seek, to pray, to call on the name of the Lord. And how do you know that? Because if God wouldn't answer him, he was going to go to the devil. 
You think God would answer you tonight? You say, I'm going to go home and I've, I've got this terrible situation and God better come through. And if he does it, I'm going to go to that new age shop down the street and I'm going to get that lady to, I'm going to get her to tell my fortune. Do you think God's going to hear you? You're going to pray and you're going to say those words. You think God's going to hear you? If God wouldn't answer him, he was going to try the devil's route. And there was another reason. Saul hated and persecuted the man after God's own heart, which was David. Look what, uh, look what Saul had done in 1 Samuel 22. Just go back a few pages. 1 Samuel 22. David has been running and, and Saul is looking for David. And Saul is frustrated because he can't find David. And Saul says, okay, he says, and, and literally, this is what the passage said. I mean, Saul, here's the he-man that he is. Man, has he ever fallen to a low place? He said, why don't you any of you feel sorry for me? Man, that sounds like a real man, doesn't it? Why don't you really feel sorry for me? Well, somebody speaks up and says, I saw David. Remember, David had fled and David had ran to Abiathar, the high priest. And look what happens in 1 Samuel 22, verse 11. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech, the priest. I, I said Abiathar, I meant Ahimelech. The king sent to call Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house. Now look, he doesn't just call the priest. Who does he call? Ahimelech, all his father's house the priests that were in Nob. And they came, all of them, to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitab. And he answered, Here am I, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread and his sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, what an answer. And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Was I on some secret mission to help him out from God? Ahimelech doesn't even understand what's going on here because David never told him. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything into his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king doesn't believe him. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. Man, it's a little extreme, isn't it? He's, just, he's not only going to kill the high priest, he's going to kill his whole clan. And the king said unto the footman that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also was with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. Good for them. Man, that's scary business to say no to the king, but none of them moved. They thought, this is wrong. They didn't even touch their swords. And the king said to Doeg, the traitor that said, I, I saw all this. Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned and he fell upon the priest. Now watch. And slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. He killed 85 people in the priesthood. Isn't it wild? You think about this a minute. You know, the Holy Ghost said they were all wearing an ephod. You know what was on the ephod? You know what the ephod was for? It was to inquire of the Lord. It was the Urim and the Thummim, and we don't know much about that. We talked about it a few weeks ago, but it was something, there's a few places it, it appears in Scripture, and David inquired of the Lord, and, and the Lord literally answered him from that Urim and Thurim, Thummim on the, on the ephod. And Saul kills 85 men wearing an ephod. And suddenly Saul gets in a mess and he says, let's pray. And God says, 
nothing doing. You're going to come to a man with an ephod and you're going to come to the Urim? God said, not on this planet. Did he inquire of the Lord? God said, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said some words. But God says, as far as I'm concerned, he had cut the phone cord. What a thing. Look at verse 3, 1 Samuel 28. What a story. It's amazing. 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul, now watch, Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. You know, Saul had outlawed witchcraft. Now, you know, he wasn't the first in Exodus 22, verse 18. God had said long before, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. But you know what happened over time, as you saw through the history of Israel? All the things that God said were not to be in Israel, slowly all those things, because people weren't doing their job, and they weren't staying faithful to God. And so when that happens, all those evil things start creeping back up. And there were all sorts of things that began to blossom again. And one of them would have been witchcraft. And so Saul comes into power and, um, you know, Saul outlaws witchcraft. And you think, well, that's really great. But there's a couple thoughts on this. Some people said, well, Saul did it at the beginning of his reign. And maybe because Samuel was trying to turn Israel back to God. Maybe that's the case. But there's also another possibility. It appears in this passage that it wasn't long before. You remember Saul was troubled with an evil spirit. And perhaps he suspected that he was bewitched, that someone had put a spirit on him. And for that reason, had cut off all the familiar spirit people out of the land. And a man of long ago, with that thought in mind, said, many seem zealous against sin when they themselves are hurt by it. Not because they're worried about the glory of God and not because they think it's so terribly sinful but just because they got burned by it. Many people are enemies to sin in others while they indulge it in themselves. Saul had outlawed witchcraft. You know, he, he was driving the devil out of his kingdom and yet he harbored the devil in his heart. You know, you could throw some things out of your house and you should. But make sure that you throw the devil out of your heart. Because if you just get rid of stuff, and man, there's some stuff that he's gotten rid of. But if you just get rid of stuff and you haven't got rid of the devil in your heart, nah, it's all coming back in. Look at verse 7. Then Saul said unto his servants, Oh boy, seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that had the familiar spirit. Isn't it interesting? I, I just I just marveled over this. Saul's servants seem to instantly know where this woman is, and yet they had not previously exposed her. It's like they had at least reserved access to at least one evil house for their own use. And suddenly now they can maybe get some favor with the king because they know where she's at. Do you know Endor was near Endor? She was the witch of Endor. Endor was nearby. Saul knew how evil witchcraft was, and yet now he resorts to it. Again, a man of long ago said, it is common for men to blast against some sin that they currently have no temptation to. But afterwards, later, they themselves are overcome by it. It's wild. I remember many years ago, I was in my 20s, and I was passing through a certain town, and I was going to be at this church, or I was going to be speaking at this church just for an evening. So I stayed at the preacher's house. And um, I was going to be there for a day or two. I think I rolled in on the Saturday night. And um, so the preacher, uh, he said, uh, have you ever heard of this guy? And he said the guy's name. I had at that point in time. Uh, you know, so we're, we're, we're going way back. You know, we're talking, you know, 35 years ago. 
this particular preacher was well known, uh, well known in the U.S. He was really a good guy, had a great reputation, and and was um, just uh, known as an amazing preacher. And he said, "Oh man," he said, "you got to hear this message." He said, "It's just amazing." So I said, "Okay, great. I, I like listening to preaching and and um, and it, you know he." Of course, this was long ago, guys, but he put it in the preaching tape. And, um, man, he had the the speakers to blast through the house. And we're sitting in the living room. I felt like, man, I was sitting right in front of the preacher. And, and um, the name of the message was called The Sickest Sin on Earth. And right away, you, you know where this is going. And he started talking about just jaded, twisted immorality. And he and it was a tremendous message. I mean, he absolutely railed on it. And he he talked about a woman that um, had been involved, and she was in his office, and and he began to deal with her, and and he realized she was demon possessed, and he talked about how he dealt with her, and how she began to throw up at the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ and all that stuff. But the whole message was on was on the just just the twisted immorality, and he probably pulled. You know, there's a few places like that in the Bible. He pulled from one of those places. Tremendous message. A few years later, wasn't long, I heard, and it became common knowledge, that he was no longer pastoring, that he was caught. And he had been dialing, at that time they were called 900 numbers, if you wanted to uh, access some certain things. And the, the way they caught it was he started dialing these numbers, not knowing that the cost for those phone calls was like, you know, $200 a minute. And then he was on the phone one day and somebody else picked up another phone in the church. And, and you know how in the old days you had all the corded phones. And if you had, if you picked up one phone in the building, if somebody else picked up another phone or even in your house, you could hear and man, it just, it just got exposed. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Do you need to preach against sin? Do you need to, do you need to, is, there, is it wrong to be repulsed or repelled by something? Oh, no, of course not. But, um, but boy, you got to watch. Sometimes you hear somebody and they just really wax eloquent on some sin they're not committing right now. Now, some of you aren't going to like this next statement, and that's okay. I'm just going to throw it out. It's still true whether you like it or not. And ha just have mercy on me. I'm not condoning this. See, there's my disclaimer. But, you know, uh, a lot of preachers, you know, and, 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 and the Lord, the Lord is against divorce. Um, Malachi, the book of the Lord hateth putting away, and he does. Man, you get some preachers and they'll, they'll, they'll start waxing eloquent and they'll just, they'll just breathe fire on that subject. I was listening to a preacher the other day and he said, you go to certain camp meetings down south and they run up to greet you. And if they don't know you, the first question they, the first question, it's not, how you doing, brother? Where are you from? It's like, they say, um, have you ever been divorced? It's like, hello, where did that come from? And I heard an old preacher make a statement about that years ago. He said, you know why they do that? He said, it's the only sin they haven't committed yet. And I heard another old preacher say, he said, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll wax eloquent on that and they'll rage on that, he said, until it visits their house. And he said, then they sing a different tune. The Bible says, rejoice with trembling. Happy is the man that feareth always. Are you doing good today? You say, boy, I'm not struggling with this, but I know somebody that is, but I'm just so much more spiritual. If they were spiritual to me, they wouldn't struggle with that. Oh, you better get alone, and you better ask God to have mercy on your proud, foolish soul. That's what you better do. You see somebody struggling, you better pray for them. You've got weaknesses too. The devil ever puts his crosshairs on you? You better hope somebody's praying for you. Thank God Jesus is. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. 
1 Samuel 28, verse 8. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, then bring him up whom I shall name unto thee. You know what this is called? There's a Bible word for this, and it shows up in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 11. You can look it up on your own time. Deuteronomy 18, 11. God told the Jews, there shall not be a necromancer among you. A necromancer means a person that's getting in touch with the dead. Here is Saul. Even as we're reading this, you know, some of us are used to reading this. We've read this story many times. But do you realize this story is absolute insanity? Is Saul really going to get help going about this the devil's way? Is he really? And look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. And the woman saw Samuel and cried with a loud voice. You know, it's interesting. As you read this story, there is a, a interesting silence from the Lord. God doesn't tell you what she did. Now, she drew a pentagram on the floor, and she had 12 candles. And she began to chant, and she it doesn't tell you anything. God would not satisfy our curiosity. God decided that what she did was evil enough. And we didn't know the details. In verse 19, look at verse 19. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. Can I ask you a question real quick? And we need to, we need to finish. Can I ask you a question? What happened here? How do we get this far from God? Do you remember how Saul's story started? It has a sweet beginning. I mean, you know, Israel makes a goofy decision, a wrong decision. And, of course, here you see the fruit of it. But they decide they want a king. And um, the Lord tells Samuel, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you anoint a king. And, of course, you know the story. Uh, Saul is, is a young man, and he's out. He's, his father has lost his sheep. And, and the Bible says Saul was a tall man. He was actually head and shoulders taller than any of the rest of the people. But he was out there hunting for his dad's sheep and, and um, and they they come into the city and and they 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 say how are we going to find the sheep and and Saul's servant says Saul's friend says let's 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 check there's a man of God in this city Samuel they said he will he will help us on our way and he goes there and next thing you know uh, Saul is anointing Samuel and uh, and you can tell from the tenor of this just the way those chapters are written even Samuel's excited. Uh, he spends time with him. He speaks the word of God to him. Uh, he, he tells him all the great things that will happen to him in the next 24 hours. And it's just a wonderful beginning. But you know what happened to Saul? It was along the way, Saul never humbled himself. And, um, you know, he made some blunders. But what you see here is with each one of Saul's blunders, he never humbled himself. He got confronted. And sometimes he would even acknowledge it once he got exposed. But he would never humble himself. 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 Do you know there was a king that was far worse, far worse than Saul? You know the problem of Christians in 2024? They're a whole lot like Saul, with the exception of, you know, we realize, we realize Saul killed those 85 priests, okay, we realize that. But but outside of that, and even then, there was a king that was far worse than that. And God showed him mercy. You know what Saul is like? Saul's like a lot of Christians in 2024. They're really not bad guys. They're, they're not bad ladies. They're, they're not that bad. Do you realize Saul never took Israel into idolatry? A whole bunch of the other kings did. I want you to look at one of the kings that was terrible. In fact, out of God's own mouth, he was one of the worst, if not the worst, of all the kings. And that's in 2 Chronicles 33.
Look at 2 Chronicles 33, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years. Can you imagine this? He reigned longer than any other king. What? Why, why does God let some of these guys live as long as he does? And yet, he did. Verse 2. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out for the children of Israel. For he built again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had broken down. And he reared up altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Also, he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall be my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with the familiar spirit, meaning all the time. And with wizards, he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, in which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. Verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, that means to go astray, and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Look at 2 Kings 21, verse 16. 2 Kings 21. You know, some of Saul's shenanigans were one-time events. You know, Saul, Saul doesn't destroy Amalek. Okay, that was a one-time event that happened on one day. Saul doesn't wait for Samuel and jumps the gun and does a sacrifice. That happened on one day. Saul kills 85 priests. That happened on one day. Manasseh lived out his whole reign absolutely spitting in the face of God. Look at um, 2 Kings 21. And you find something else that the Lord says about Manasseh. 2 Kings 21, 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Boy, the Lord wants you to know how bad this was. Beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin. God said he just, he just killed people right, left, and center. Manasseh was far worse. But would you look at 2 Chronicles 33 one more time? 2 Chronicles 33. You know what was different between these two? Saul had never waded into idolatry. Saul had no golden calves. Saul had no Molech. Saul did not sacrifice the children. Saul did not desecrate the tabernacle or the temple. Saul did not worship the sun or Tammuz. Lord, I'm not near as bad as so-and-so. God says, when you play that game, you're making a mistake. Comparing themselves among, measuring themselves by themselves, God says, you don't understand. God says, that doesn't work with me. God says, I don't deal with people on that basis. Saul wasn't that bad. But you know what Saul wouldn't do? Look at 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. How long he was there, we're not sure. But I guarantee you, it wasn't a week or two. It was a lot longer than that. And, verse 12, when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God 
and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated. God says, God says, I, I heard him. God didn't hear Saul. He was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again. This is amazing. To Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. What a crazy thing. Manasseh. It's a wonder God didn't strike him dead long, long, long before. But he lives and he's a thousand times worse than Saul. You know what was different between Manasseh and Saul? Manasseh humbled himself. And he humbled himself greatly. And you know what? It wasn't just in word only. You know, because God sees through all that. He, he didn't just say something. He, if, he, if God ever let him out of that prison, it was all going to be different. And you read Manasseh got out, and man, it was different. You know what he did? He humbled himself. Samuel looks at Saul and he says, when thou wast little in thine own sight, God anointed thee to be king. You know, there was there was a good, good days for Saul. You know when the good days were? When he was little. When he was little and God was big, the blessings flowed. When he was little and God was big. When he was little and he was a child and he didn't know what he was doing, Jeremiah said, oh, Lord God, I am a child. Solomon said, oh, Lord God, I don't know how to lead this people. Boy, when he was little and God was big. You know, God gives grace to the humble. So I want to end on this note tonight. You know, the blessing of this whole thing is, it's a blessing for all of us tonight. And I think you all know this, and I, I think you all do this. But I want to encourage you tonight. Boy, Saul started off good. But you know, we need to keep going like we started off. When we started off, we didn't know anything. When we started off, you know, we, we were teachable. We were, we were open and we were, we were little in our own sight. And you know what? The blessings flowed and the answers flowed and we called and God answered. And you know what? We can live that way all the way home. If we stay little and God stays big, the blessings will flow. God giveth grace to the humble. And the blessing is, it's a simple thing that anybody can do. You know, not everybody can sing a beautiful song. Not everybody can be, can be part of, a, of, you know, some musical thing. Not everybody can stand up and address a crowd. And not everybody can do. But you know what everybody can do? You know, everybody can have God's grace. Everybody can be blessed like we were talking about this morning. Everybody can humble themselves. And you know what? Uh, you know what John the Baptist said? He said, he must increase. He said, I want God to get bigger. He said, but I must decrease. Well, John, don't you know you're the greatest that was ever born a woman? And he said, he must increase. But I must decrease. I like what Paul said in Ephesians 3, and I close with this. Paul said, you know what I do when I look at the Lord? He said, I bow my knees unto the God of heaven and earth. You know why Saul couldn't get in touch with God? He wouldn't humble himself. He's the God of all grace. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. Is there ever a time I would call and not get it? Only one. And that's if there's any pride in your heart. If there's any pride in your approach. But if you can look yourself in the mirror. And say God. I am truly nothing. And you are everything. If you can stay low. You know that, that pride thing. It, it shows itself in the way people react to others. The way people view others. The way they view themselves. And God looks and God sees that. And God says, if you'll stay humble, he says, if you'll keep me big and you little, he said, I'll keep the grace coming. And you and I will never end up like Saul. 
We'll never wind up in that place where we can't get a hold of God. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth. Lord, these are your good people tonight. Lord, they've come and they came in the bad weather. And Lord, there's other people that couldn't come tonight and they're listening, they're watching. And Lord, they're your good people too. Lord, they just couldn't make it tonight. Lord, I pray for all our people and I pray for me too, Lord. Lord, would you help us that we would always be little in our own sight? God, would you help us that we never wind up in that place, Lord, where we can't get a hold of you? Thank you, Lord. The door's open tonight. And Lord, anybody can humble themselves. Lord, help us. Help us to stay real good all our life at humbling ourselves, Lord, in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, the piano's going to play. If God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him? pride that says I would never do that it's pride that looks down your nose at somebody else because they're just they don't have it on the ball like you well you better be careful with that you start thinking that way and you're probably going to cut the phone line I need thee every hour, every hour. Lord, keep me low. God says, if you'll go low, I'll, I'll take you up. There's some people still praying tonight. Boy, isn't it good that God can love a man like Manasseh and be so gracious and kind to him because God knew someday he'd humble himself. God is good. He, he's just going to bless you. Lord, thank you for this story. And Lord, help us, Lord, that we would just gladly, Lord, let you increase. Lord, help us in these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.